All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to another Learning Tech Talks, where we are continually exploring the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff and answering your questions in real time uh, to help you get the answers you need to make the most of your, you know, I don't even have a good way to finish that sentence, but you, you get the gist of it. If you haven't, if you've seen it before, if you haven't, we're talking learning, learning tech, learning strategy, all this fun stuff. And today I'm joined by David Verhag, right? I got it right? Yep. I did. Sweet. Excellent. All right. My notes, my notes kept it right. All right. And we're going to be talking about Olafano, but we're going to be talking about real-time performance support, what that means, what that looks like, and some creative ways that David and his team are bringing this to life. I've got some great analogies that I think are going to pull it together. But hey, before we even get into that, we've got to do what we always do. We're going to do a little bit of icebreaker stuff to greet the folks that are here, get to know you a little bit better, David. So why don't we start with this one? For those watching, play along with us and comment in and share where you're joining us from. David, where are you in the world today? I am in Park City, Utah, working out of a shared office space. I have a tiny little house uh, way up in the mountains, and so I uh, commute down to the office here for faster internet. <laughs> I was gonna say you didn't want you didn't want to disconnect in the middle of the conversation. I take it exactly, yeah. And and I noticed too because the last time we talked, you were in your mountain cabin, and it was a very different backdrop than the one that I'm seeing now. So uh, looks pretty quiet there, though. Is it quiet there today? Still early on a Friday for a shared office. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, so I'm in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where I always am. The usual space. Fred is joining me in the background here. Um, so then the icebreaker question today, not related to performance support, not related to anything like that. A little bit of a fun one. Um, you can play along if you're watching too. So please answer this as well. But David, you've had some time to think about this now. So if someone, let's say one of our random watchers or listeners, were to open up your Pandora or Spotify app of choice, whatever, or if you still rock in a old school I, iTunes or what was it? What were they called? iPod. iPod. Doesn't matter to me. But what's something in your playlist that people would be surprised to find? They might raise an eyebrow and go, I would not have expected that. Yeah, I'm not sure it would surprise folks who know me, but uh, I'm using Pandora. Uh, and have a couple of uh, channels that I switch between. So on the drive into work, it's uh, Counting Crows, uh, that that channel, uh, Six Pence on the Richer type channel. So that's okay. kind of some easy rock music on the drive in. And then on the drive uh, back up the mountain, uh, I listen to comedy channels, kind of post work. I try and uh, lighten up my mood a little bit. So I listen to like okay. uh, Nate Bergazzi, uh, one of my current favorites uh, for a comedy channel. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. All right. I do like that you referred to six pence, none the richer as rock. I don't know that that's the category. I mean, you did you did add light rock, but I don't know yeah. that rock is really what I think when I think six pence, none the richer counting crows. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Um, <laughs> All right. So mine is a little bit more. So literally, I think anybody who and I actually pulled it up over here just so that I had it to, as a reminder, because I think anybody that scrolled through mine would go, do you share your username and password with a lot of people? Because it's a very weird, obscure thing. And so I, I couldn't really narrow it down to one thing. But I tend to one of the things that people might be surprised is I listen to a lot of music from other cultures. I am fascinated by it. And so I really dig into it. And I end up, you know, one of mine is like Indian wedding party radio. I listen to it when I work out. That's one of my recent ones. And the other one that's been at the top of my playlist recently, I've been listening to a lot of Scottish bagpipes and drums. Just <laughs> it's, it's like on repeat. So anyway, again, a lot of different things. I've had tribal music. I've had Latin, all kinds of over the place. It just kind of always fascinates me to take in different cultures through their music. So anyway, if you ever get a hold of my iPhone and you're like, what is this? It is actually, <laughs> I'm not sharing my, I'm not sharing my account information, Pandora, if you're watching. Um, so let's, let's shift gears. Let's start talking about this over. We're going to talk about the topic at hand, which is learning knowledge in the flow of work. It's a, two weeks on this theme actually, but you're doing it in a slightly different way. So before we get into it, 
give me a little bit of background for those who may not be familiar with David Verhag. Who who are you? Like, how did you end up founding Olofano? Yeah. So as as defined by work, I've I've spent my career in HR and HR technology. I actually started uh, went to school for HR. Started as a recruiter, a generalist, HR manager, director of HR for commercial real estate before jumping over to HR tech. And I was super lucky to, to find uh, success factors way back in uh, 2004 when they were still, you know, 120, 130 people. Um, spent eight and a half years there growing through the company, through IPO, through the acquisition by SAP. And then since then, spent a couple of years at Hireview at a marketing automation company. Uh, and then at Degreed, where I was chief customer officer, uh, building and scaling their their post sale teams, uh, and that ult- that all of that experience is what ultimately led me to you know founding Olafano, because across that entire journey, the challenge was always how do we get the employee to access the information, whatever it is that that we're providing to them. If it's learning, right. how do we get the employee to stop what they're doing and access all this great learning content? And they have to jump <laughs> to this separate platform to do it's it. A, I know. It's a battle everyone in the industry faces. We create all this amazing stuff. We produce all this awesome stuff. There's there's lots of resources out there and yet we're constantly asking people to stop what they're doing and go find it. And, it, and it's a it's a crazy big problem. So Microsoft found that people open and switch tabs like 373 times per day. And so I used to ask. Or some folks, people just have all 376 open. Exactly. I've seen those too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's where I was going. I used to ask people, how many tabs do you have open right now? And the answer was consistently 30 plus. And it's like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, you know, I have all these different applications and average employee uses 36 different applications. And, wow. and so it's like, wow, it's no wonder people can't find what they're looking for and they spend so much time searching. So the idea with Olafana was, let's take all of that information in the ecosystem and bring it to the employee where they're actually doing their work. So they spend 30% of their time in email. Let's make sure that all of that knowledge, insight, learning is available in email. They're working in Google Docs or across, you know, in any of these different pages. Let's bring the knowledge to them versus asking them to, to go to it. Okay. And so that was the original idea and where we started. Okay. Okay. So the, and that, and that I think highlights the original problem statement is, which was, what's the problem you were trying to solve, which is people have hundreds or tens, if not hundreds of browser tabs, trying to pull all this stuff together, constantly flipping between that. And usually the LMS is not one of them, by the way, I (laughs) I've discovered that the LMS is not usually one of those most commonly used browser tabs that people have, but then bringing it in. So then let's, let's talk a little bit more about the journey Olafano is, or let's define it a little bit, because like you said, in concept, it's which, and this is another random thing. You mentioned an email, which there was a pulse survey done. uh, I don't remember where it was. That's like the number one thing people have open Uh, out of all the apps that people use. Their email is basically always something that is open and at the ready. They're scanning it, they're looking at it in pretty much every situation. So you mentioned that. So these are the kinds of things that are going on. So talk, let's define what Olafano is in simple terms because we said, hey, okay, there's all this stuff. We gotta bring it to people where they are. What is it doing then? Yeah, so Olafano is a a Chrome extension is where we started. And so we work across Chrome tabs. And a lot like a spell checker, you know, think of like Grammarly is a perfect analogy. Grammarly is scanning what you're working on as you're typing it. And when they identify something that's misspelled or, you know, language use that's incorrect, they highlight it and tell you how to correct it. Well, Lafano is doing something similar. We're scanning the text as you're working. And when we spot keywords and key phrases where we know there's learning assets available, we highlight those so that you can get a quick pop-up access to the knowledge that you need just in time and in the context of what you're working on. Okay. And, and you originally, I remember when we first talked, you talked about the Grammarly analogy, which to me, that was the perfect analogy of, I use Grammarly all the time. It's fantastic. You're just writing and then either in real time, or there's a little ball at the bottom that just says like, Hey, don't use this word or this is something else you need to do, but it's trying to correct your writing. What you're talking about is I'm seeing some of these keywords in the example we talked about before we went live. You keep at, you mentioned remote work policy. 
here's our remote work policy and let's actually just link you out to it if you need that kind of thing, right? That That's exactly right. And so rather than having the employees stop what they're doing, try and find which of the open, you know, 30 tabs that they have, you know, <laughs> accesses that system. If they even know, a lot of times it's a simple fact that, well, oh. I don't know if we have it. And so employees yes. spend, knowledge workers spend like three hours a week. Google found this, three hours a week recreating content that already exists because they can't find it. And it's a huge productivity drag of, of recreating. And your learning content is just this asset, this tremendous asset that's sitting out there just waiting to be, uh, you know, waiting to add value. It's just that. Well, not only the three hours, not only the three hours per week that somebody's a knowledge worker is spending create, recreating this stuff, but the original team that created the actual thing, I just think, I just think, let's say the HR policy. Okay, I'm just thinking about that one. The HR remote work policy, extremely relevant for the times at hand right now. But if you think about it, I, I've been in these meetings. I know how much work goes into creating the actual HR policy. Lots of time and effort goes into creating it and then resources to support it and frequently asked questions and all this stuff that goes into it that goes into the ether. It goes on to some intranet page somewhere, SharePoint, some Google Doc is sitting out somewhere that nobody ever finds and all those man hours then are on something that people don't end up using and then to make it worse according to your study then everybody's going man wouldn't it be great if we really had a policy that kind of guidelined us you know why don't we just make one and we'll just put it out on our own yeah. internal site that now nobody is able to find yeah exactly or the other thing they do is they jump into to slack or into google chat and they post a question to you know 250 people in the sales team channel. Does anybody know where this is? And 250 people are distracted for a few minutes or for 30, you know, trying to think about. Well, I think we talked about this, and so you know that's where Olafano plays this this role is, you know, it's not you know recreating that that content, but you know I think you talked about it in one of your earlier episodes where you challenge your team to cut things in half, cut them in half again, cut them in half again distill it down to the essence. And that's where Olafano's the, the pop-up learning adds value. It's like in the moment of need, when you're talking about remote work policy, pop this up, remind somebody we have one. It's at your discretion as a manager. And here's the, here's the doc, here's the form that you need. And maybe, you know, here's one thing to think about if you're talking to your employee about this, just in time learning uh, that reinforces everything else that you've already done to inform that employee. Okay. So, and I know you've got, you've got an example of, of it just so people can see what it looks like. So at some point we'll, we'll pull it up just to be able to highlight that. But I want to talk through the general workflow because this was something that was even, you know, I, I had to unpack a little bit with you was how exactly do these different pieces fit together? Cause there's a content creation piece built into it as well. So as we're thinking about this, and I think one of the things, and this will be an important thing to talk about on this content creation is what you just mentioned is this idea of we have this tendency to do the kitchen sink methodology of the telling people things like, well, they asked about remote work policy. We should tell them what remote work is and why don't while we add it also add, you know, what it means to be a great leader in the remote environment. And pretty soon you've got the Franken knowledge course of literally everything someone might want to know when really somebody's just like, where's the policy? Or do managers have discretion to know what to do with it? And literally you can say that in a sentence, but let's, let's talk about the workflow of how this thing works. Cause I think then we'll be able to dig into some of the different discrepancies that we have to tackle in each one of those. Yeah. So the original vision for Olafano was, you know, mapping and creating this ecosystem that's all, you know, API connected. Where okay. we've evolved to is we've added this content creator within Olafano, where you create these bite-sized pieces of learning that are organic to or native to Olafano. And the idea is not to reproduce all of that other learning that you have, but to distill it to the essence that somebody needs in their moment of need. And I'm I, a huge fan of, like we talked about, a huge fan of Aris and, and Michael and Ryan and Maxine and the team there and what they've done, that concept of text sized learning, but, you know, apply that to email, 
where you have 1400 characters, you have a GIF, you have some emoticons, you have some hyperlinks, something that really pops, something that says, oh, this is kind of a fresh, hot take reminder of something that I really need to know. And it's not this library, it's not the policy itself, it's the one or two or three things that I need to know about that policy. And then the link, if I wanna go grab it, it's, it's right there for me. Okay, you know, it's odd. I'd almost think you worked for a company and spent some time in the curation space because it sounds like there's a lot of curation in some regards of what we're talking about when you think about this content creation piece because the point you brought up that I think is an important one when you think about this real-time performance support is that tendency to, well, let's reinvent the wheel. And that's not the best way to do it and say, let's create the let's create a second Franken course that's the new and improved Franken course, but instead say, we've got the Franken course, we've got the policy, we don't need to recreate it and rebuild it in, in what you're saying is Olafano, but like what are the main knowledge nuggets or the main pain points that people are experiencing? Let's pull that into the feed and then if they really need it, we can link out to it and say, hey, if this didn't give you exactly what you need, here's the full story. Kind of like, in some ways, curated news clips where it's like, hey, here's the headline. If you need more than that, go here. But other than that, this might be probably all you need to know. That, that's absolutely right. And it's, um, you know, I, I think having spent so many years in, in learning and development and talent management, there's a lot of really good thought. Uh, that goes into creating really smart courses, really smart learning programs, you know, the variety of content, the structure that they put into it, all of the, the academics behind, you know, really good instructional design. And so it's, it's not an attempt to recreate or a sidestep that, but rather that last mile problem, helping to solve for that, uh, you know, the forgetting curve. You know, I, t I take the training course and I walk out of the room and I start to forget. At the end of the week, I've forgotten, you know, most of it. You know, <laughs> 30 days later, I've forgotten 80% of it. But, you know, what if with Olafano, as I'm working, I'm getting in-context reminders, those little pokes that say, hey, remember this, or hey, you, you learned about this, or hey, here's the asset. And so, and because we can link these together and stage them in a way that kind of creates, uh, you know, sequenced learning, it helps to reinforce the learning that you've already done through those really good L&D programs. Okay. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen and a trend in our industry that I think we have to be careful of is there's this pendulum of what I would call long form or formal learning. And then there's this real time performance support nudges, almost just kind of content nudge. And we sometimes have a tendency to swing back and forth where it's like, well, formal learning's everything. We need formal skill development. We need to go deep in everything. Then we we throw it out the window and we go, forget that. Everything's micro learning, nano learning even. Uh, RS guys will remember that one, right? Our, nano learning. And then we swing this way and we're like, everything is, is nano learning. And it's like, well, no, it's kind of in between. And I think going back to this point of it's not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but saying, hey, where are these instances where something really important and we know is a, a sticking point for people? We know this is a sticking point for people in the organization. And we've produced really good comprehensive stuff, but not everybody needs that comprehensive stuff. So rather than clockwork orange them through the whole thing, Let's let them know in that moment where they need a nudge. And if they need more than a nudge, so be it. Great. If they're going like, I'm actually really struggling with this. I need to do more than just thanks for the tip, but that's not going to cut. Well, great. Then fine. But let's not punish the entire organization. Yeah, absolutely true. And, and nudging theory is a great uh, relevant example. You know, what Laszlo and, and the, the team at, at Humo are doing for, you know, behaviors and kind of performance support with a little you know, nudges for behavior is a good analogy for how, you know, we're thinking about this as, as well. Just the, the little clips of information that help you uh, work better, work more productively. Yeah. Well, and uh, and that's the goal, isn't it? We're trying to improve productivity on this. And if people are spending three hours duplicating, replicating content that already exists, and then however many hours scanning 
the interwebs, plus pinging 250 people in Yammer, Slack, or Workplace to ask them if they know where it is, we're now adding a lot of inefficiency into the mix. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of social platforms where you can go ask questions, but the question of, hey, do you know where this is? Or does anybody, that's probably not the best use of our human capabilities and that time. But I do want to, this is actually, Deborah brought up a good question, which actually is a interesting one. I'm curious your thoughts on, I've got a point of view on it. And I do think it's a risk and something that has to be considered, which is why I think it's really important. You do this thoughtfully and don't just go, let's make everything. Uh, let's make everything. a. what do you, do you have like a term for them? Like an Olafano? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing, but her question is, do you think there's a danger that just-in-time knowledge might make people lazy and not really learn and remember that they could just become so reliant on the product like Grammarly that they don't actually decide to learn the details behind it? I'm going to let you respond to it because it's a really good question, but I, I've got a point of view on this, and I, and I would say tread with caution. That, that I should tread with caution? No, no, that, no, no, uh... no, 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 no. My perspective is tread carefully. Yes, yes, David, don't don't answer this wrong or I'll just kick you out of the feed. No, no, no. That's kind of my guidance, but I'm curious how you, how, where you, have you thought about that or what's your take on it? You know, I honestly, I haven't thought about that. You know, from a productivity standpoint, um, you know, I, I've been focused on, you know, people go to these learning programs, instructional designers and L&D put together these really great programs. It's that last mile, it's that performance support, it's, it's in the moment of need where we can reinforce that learning. Um, I hadn't actually considered that it would make people uh, lazy or that they, they wouldn't absorb the learning that they, they, that they were provided. Um, I'm super curious to hear your, your, your take on it though. So needless to say, I have thought ad nauseum about this over the years, actually. So it's if you if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll actually see some of my deeper thoughts on this because this is a this is a legitimate risk, and, and I and I say this because this is why you need to be very thoughtful when you think about real time for performance support and a, a research study. You can actually Google and look at this. If you look at what GPS is doing, it's actually degrading people's memory because they're becoming so reliant on turn by turn directions that and I've I've seen people may even know some folks who they don't even know how to get to the local grocery store without the GPS because they've be, become so reliant on it that they can't even wait do I like what street am I on right now it's actually having a negative impact for those moments and it's degrading their critical thinking and their memory it's it's actually really fascinating which is why I think you have to be careful with this. And you don't want to just say, let's just make everything something that doesn't require people to think, but be more intentional about the, as you said, what are the things that are reinforcing? What things are reinforcing things we know that they need to learn, but we need to give people these nudges. We need to nudge them along the way. Or there are certain things that I would say, is it really relevant that you learn this? Do you really need to know where the policy for something is? Do you really need to know that this, it's not necessarily a skill or a knowledge gap that needs to be filled, in which case you'd say, all this is doing is slowing people down. In those instances, fantastic, do it. And is there opportunity to help people kind of nudge along the way? Yes, but I do think you do need to be at least thoughtful about not going over the end of this where people suddenly start forgetting how to do very basic things because they're like, well, I'm waiting for the system to tell me how to do X, Y, Z. Now, again, that's going pretty far down the rabbit hole. And I think from an opportunity area, I'm hesitant to even caution people in that because we're so far from doing it <laughs> to the degree of GPS and ways that we're actually negatively impacting people's memory and critical thinking through performance support, which is why I say think carefully, but we've got a long ways to swing the pendulum, in my opinion, before we get to this point of it's like, we're doing this so well, people are not, people are not even remembering how to do basic things. Yeah, it's uh, that that's fascinating. It's a good thread uh, for, for me to 
pull on after the meeting. So Deborah, super appreciate the the, the question. Um, you know, on one hand, as a founder, the idea of having technology that people become so reliant upon that they drive into a lake, you know, like they do, they do with <laughs> GPS. And it's like, well, you know, as a founder of a company, I, I don't know, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but to, to your point, the ultimate goal was to enable people to, to work better, to work productively, get the innovation that they needed just in time when they need it. And having worked with L&D professionals and working with the brilliant L&D professionals uh, today, you know, I, I put a little bit of the ownership of that on them, you know, for yes. utilizing tools, regardless of what tool it is, but utilize the tools in a really smart way. You can take a brilliant yep. LXP, stuff it full of your legacy uh, <laughs> required learning, yes. and it's not going to deliver the results. You could put too much into Olafano, and it's just going to annoy people. It's going to pop up on everything. Or you could use it in a really smart way where people are like, oh, my God, I should have known that. I had a training yes. on that last week. I totally forgot. Or there's that thing that I needed. Well, and I think to your point with that, you know, this is the technology is is a tool. And where the chaos or the success comes really is the responsibility as of as us as practitioners of how do we use this. And let's let's go back to Grammarly because I, like I said, I use it all the time. And if you actually look at the way Grammarly has evolved, Grammarly used to just change your stuff. It used to just say, oop, just, just do this. Now it actually gives you little nudges as to why. So going back to Deb's comment, Deborah's comment, it's actually giving you some feedback on like, hey, you're using the passive voice. You may want to consider doing this, or this is a little bit too wordy. You may want to consider right. So it's actually giving you some more of that context. But that's in the designer. That's the designer over at Grammarly that's thinking about, hey, how do we do this in a way that we're not just fixing the problem and eliminating their need to think, but we're enabling them, giving them that nudge so that they have some context. So hopefully they make less of these mistakes in the future. And again, if you look at Grammarly, it rates your improvement. You actually get reports on how you're improving as a writer so that you can start to see, oh, you know, I don't write in passive voice as much. I don't do as many comma splices as I used to, things like that so that you can start to see I'm actually making less mistakes. So that's where I think the designer plays a critical role as they think about this and how you would use the tool. But the capability is is tremendous in the fact that you're actually in line catching people. Well, and it gives the, the, the L&D team and the designers a new level of insight as well. So from an Olofano reporting perspective, you know, so we're surfacing these keywords in the flow of work, keywords and key phrases. Um, and users are accessing that content via the pop-up. Maybe they're clicking on the hyperlink or, or maybe they're not. We're tracking that behavior and reporting that back to the L&D team so that they know, hey, last week, 300 people saw the keyword remote work. 250 people clicked on it. 100 people accessed the, the URL. Well, that's an insight that you just don't have today if that document no. is sitting out on a Google Drive or even if it's sitting in you know, some, some other legacy knowledge platform and you don't know the context that they're using it in. So that insight would say, hey, everybody's focused on remote work and you know what, we might wanna do some additional training around this because everybody's you know, clicking on this and consuming this content real time. Uh, and it, so it gives you a new insight into where people's minds are at, where they, where okay. they need help uh, in the moment. Well, and this again, just then that helps from an analytics standpoint, because when we think about this, this to me is one of the most exciting and tread with caution territories again with with the technology is the fact that we can now capture insights on workforce behavior and and what those needs are in ways we couldn't before, because before, like you said, we made this stuff, we put it out somewhere, maybe it got assigned mandatorily, maybe it sat on a shared drive. We don't really know what happened to it versus I'm just thinking through a workflow. Let's say with remote work as an example, you're triggering something to keyword off remote work policy or something like that. Now you start to think critically about that and go, you know, if that's coming up in somebody's email or a document, they may be a people leader and may be thinking, how do I manage as a people leader thing? Maybe one of the things we add to this nudge is an article or some content around 
managing a remote workforce. And now let's see, do people go there? Do they access it? Is that now something that we go, you know what, there's a lot of curiosity. There's a lot of questions and engagement in this kind of stuff. Maybe to your point, we should spend a little bit more time on that because that seems to be an area of, of opportunity. Yeah, it's a, it's a new level. And, and so rather than saying, hey, let's put that article or let's put all of that, you know, long format content in Olafano, rather, let's leverage the, the power of our LXP to, you know, post an article there and share it with the same cohort of people. Maybe it's people leaders who need that article. Let's share it out with them in longer format in the LXP and then tra track the maps from there to see how people are engaging. So continuing to use each piece of technology for its intended purpose um, and then tracking the, the behavior uh, and then the associated outcomes, of course, uh, from that, that content. It just gives okay. one more piece of the equation, I think. And we've tried it super carefully. So the idea of, you know, Grammarly scanning, you, you get really comfortable with that idea of, well, it's just correcting spelling. You know, Olafano scanning my text and they're, they're reporting on on words that I use. Well, what about those inappropriate emails I send or the, you know, the grocery list? Are they <laughs> or the ones that? you don't send, right? We've all done that where you exactly. type up the email because you're really mad and you're like, you know what? I'm going to put that in drafts because I know I'm not actually going to send it. And now this thing's going to give me a pop-up saying, controlling your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Do people not send those emails? I always just hit send and then regret mm -hmm. it later. <laughs> I've learned to, I've learned to not because <laughs> recall on Outlook does not work like you think it works. <laughs> yeah. So we've actually treaded super carefully on the analytics side. We're only tracking. So we're scanning that text. And, and we're using that to identify keywords, key phrases for our natural language processing and, and the understanding. But we're not we're not saving any of that. We're not capturing that. And we're only reporting on the keywords that have been put into Olafano as words to flag up for users. So you see remote work as a keyword that's been flagged, how many times, how people used it, did they click the link, but you don't see any of the other associated words okay. in the rest of the email because it's just not appropriate for us to, to capture or report. Well, that. you know, and that's a good that's a good point of clarification, which was actually what I was, I, I was gonna do it a little bit later, but since you brought it up, I think it's a really important point to factor in because this is where some of the conspiracy theory stuff around what is the technology doing is can be risky, you know, can be risky where people go, well, this thing, I, I listen to this learning tech talks and this technology is sitting, reading all of my emails and scan. And it's like, no, it's not, it's not, it is, but not in the way that I would read an email. If you had me sitting, scanning your emails and looking at it, it's not cognitively processing and analyzing it in the same way a person would. It's more so to your point, looking for, hey, I'm trained to look for these specific things. So I'm scanning the text. I'm looking to see if those are there and that's it. I'm not taking copies of your emails. I'm not doing all this other stuff in the background. And I know that even the digital adoption technologies have had to overcome this barrier because this is something that they've had to deal with where companies go, wait, you're sitting there scanning our Salesforce instance. And it's like, Yes, but no, in the sense that, yes, we're <laughs> identifying the things that you've told us to look for. We're not sitting, scanning and analyzing and now keeping records of everything in your systems. That's right. It's, it's just not, it, it, it doesn't go that far. We're looking for the keywords, key phrases that you have told us proactively. Look for these keywords, look for these key phrases so that we can trigger you know, that uh, performance support in the moment of need. We're not going any further to understand, you know, what else is happening in that, uh, in, in that email. Okay. So then this next piece ties to actually Deb asked another really good question. Deb, I'm sorry. I keep shortening your name. I hate when people shorten my name. So Deborah uh, asked another good question that actually ties to where I was going with this next is, so we, we do this and we've talked about the fact that this is triggering off keywords that people have identified. So the designer plays a critical role in this and saying, hey, where do we think these problems may exist? What keywords might most associate with this? Now, that's easy to try and take a guess at, but you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn things over time. So two follow-up questions. One is, can and how do you adapt and evolve what it's triggering off of based on things you may learn 
And two, is there is there something that also allows for a feedback loop in there that allows people to then say, this, this was not helpful to me? Or how do you continue evolving that to make sure that you're keeping your Olafanos as relevant as possible? Yeah, from a, a, a adjacency standpoint, we haven't really solved for, for that yet. Um, so okay. we're looking for those words that, you know, as a L&D team, we think that people would be interested in. And we leverage, you know, kind of the tagging mechanisms from your LXP to understand what people are searching for, what are hot topics and those sorts of things. But from a adjacency standpoint, we just candidly, we haven't solved for, for that yet. Okay. Um, it still relies on that L&D person to say, hey, people are searching for remote working a lot. What are other ways of thinking about remote working? that they, they may be using, you know, in, in lieu of that. Um, relatively easy, but manual uh, solve there. Okay. Um, from a feedback standpoint, what we've added, and we have this in our roadmap, is um, the same way that the Grammarly has, you know, don't, don't show me this again. Um, okay. we're, we're adding that to the, the pop-up so that if we're triggering on remote work, and you know what, I know everything that I want to know about remote work, I can simply hit, don't show me this again. And that becomes a reportable event that L&D can then use to say, hey, we surfaced remote work you know, 500 times this week. 300 times people said, don't show me this again. Okay. It's either an old topic, they don't care about it, or the hit that I found is, is relevant enough. Um, so that's okay. a relatively easy uh, roadmap item for us. Other good well, questions, Deborah, the, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. And I think the first one though, the first point of, and again, I appreciate the candor behind it, but this also goes back to how you need to be thinking about your systems in terms of broader system architecture, because it'd be easy to sit in a room and just think, oh, we've made this content, like, let's just make up some words we think people might use. But they are using those words in other systems that we have that you can go look. If you have an LXP, you can see what are some of the most commonly searched things. What are the terms people are using? Even within your Microsoft suite, if you have Microsoft or Google suite, you can start to see what are people actually looking for? How are they describing it? Things like that can then feed that back. So it doesn't need to be done in a vacuum. And I think that's one of the things where as you start to think about system architecture and the different technologies you have available, you actually can start to say, well, what do we know? What are some of the things? What are some of this other metadata that we know is actually triggering this in these other systems? Now let's bring this in. And then I think to your point of the feedback loop, that that does create, a tr again, if you create a nudge and you're like, oh, every time somebody says this word, we should do this. And then you realize 99 out of 100 people are like, can you please stop? <laughs> this is either you've picked a word that's way too common, like work. <laughs> yep, yep. Or you need to refine your thing because they're like, good grief, I'm getting nudged on every fourth word in my sentence because I keep, you know, you've triggered it off of something that doesn't need to happen. So that's that's extremely helpful in that sense. Yeah. We spent a lot of time over the last two years working on user experience. So in the early beta with users and in the pilots that we ran with a couple of customers, focusing on getting the interaction with the hover rovers exactly right so that you don't inadvertently get the pop-up when you don't want it, but you get the pop-up quick enough when you do. So we highlight the word in green, underline the word in green, highlight it in green so you know it's there, but it, it takes a little bit of a delay of hovering over it to trigger that content so you're not getting all of these pop-ups. Okay. And you also only get you know one occurrence of a word per you know piece of content that you're working on. So we've put a lot of thought into how can we enable these interactions to be fun and pop-up oriented like pop-up video, um, but not so much that it's clippy, you know, that it's driving me nuts when I'm just trying to get something. Uh, something hey, done. you know what? RIP Clippy. I, I, I Clippy, <laughs> I liked Clippy. I, you know, other than ahead the fact he time. completely, he <laughs> was ahead of the time. Other than the fact he totally took your computer down sometimes because yeah. he just was a resource hog. Rest in peace, my friend. You were you were um, uh, a, a character of in ahead of your time. But I think the other thing too that you talked about, you know, this pop up video concept, which I guess it shows our age a little bit that we're talking about VH1s you know, pop up video. Although I think they might still even do it anyway. Let's not go down that rabbit trail. But 
this idea of how can we actually inline do this? And again, you you did put one together. So if you if you have it queued and we want to kind of talk about this, it would be helpful for folks who may not be quite as familiar with Grammarly or some of these other inline technologies. Because again, this is a real this is a real challenge for folks who are doing this. Where when you think about it, you're trying to you're, you're, you're asking people to go do stuff somewhere else. So let me actually pull it into the feed and then just walk me through kind of how this is, how this is playing out. Yep. So you're up, you're live. Okay, perfect. So think of this as an email that you're writing, you know, hundreds of times per, per day, right? And in this case, we're talking, I use the word, you know, work remotely. Now behavior today is, you know, you've asked me, can I work remotely? I know that I had a training a few weeks ago. I don't remember anything about it. I, I know that it's probably going to be a problem if there's a form or something that I need to go find. So with Olofano enabled, and I'm just going to enable my Chrome extension, what you'll see is that we dynamically scan this. And now you have this, this subtle little hover over that's available here for work remotely that pops up the additional content uh, that, that, that we've just been talking about. So. You know, a couple of important notes, including, you know, that policy statement. We support it. It's at your discretion as a people leader. Good reminder of what I was trained on six weeks ago. All of them need to be documented. And you know what? Here's the form that you're going to need to do that. Keys to success. And again, if I want to learn more, this could take me back into my LXP where, you know, we have the full bus training program, maybe some of micro learning and all of that sort of stuff. And this is working real time. So, you know, it was, let's say something like maybe a uh, hybrid work arrangement. We're, we're scanning and we're picking up on that word hybrid. And boom, there's a different type of, uh, you know, a performance huh. support of, of a, of a pop-up there, you know, key things to consider. Um, so that's so that's kind of the the core idea. Well, I mean, from a sim, from a from a user experience standpoint, to your point, I'll take it back down so we can just chat because I think that does highlight again the the Grammarly analogy with what you just showed sticks it, because that's really exactly how Grammarly works. You're you're just going along typing your thing, and it's like, hey, here's a call out for you to remind you that you spelled this wrong or you didn't use the right tense type of a thing. Now, I think the piece that is cannot be understated with this, though, and actually this adds to a follow up question to you is that little, by the way, I love the gifts, gifts, gifs. I don't know. It depends on who you ask. But yeah. I love the fact that it's simple. So if something's coming to you and you're like, I am trying to figure this out, you can get the nudge that you need. But that's a design shift for designers because that's that's a completely different thing than saying all right now how do we pack everything that we would pack into a course into this now are there limitations or in that little pop up what is the options that you have to create your little pop up knowledge nugget <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're thinking that I'm not going to fall for it though I'm not I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna say that. Uh, I'll just rely on you um, okay. So we, we've limited the, the amount of text to like 1,400 characters, uh, okay. and we support GIFs, we support the emoticons that you saw, we support multiple links out, uh, and the formatting using a rich text editor for different you know, font sizes, italicies, bolds, et cetera, to create a really engaging uh, piece of, of pop-up learning. Uh, it really is up to the, you know, the, the team using it to use the technology in a smart way to create things that are fun. That's why I use uh, cat gifs and, and those sorts of things to, to show that, you know, this type of learning, this type of learning reinforcement can be fun. It can be engaging. It can be that thing yeah. from L&D that kind of makes that salesperson in the moment laugh, you know, to see the church lady wagging her finger when they're, you know, using language that they shouldn't be using. You know, maybe they're asking for a social security number for some reason. And and we highlight that as a word. It's like, uh uh-uh, uh, don't don't <laughs> don't go down that path. You should be asking well, for this type of information. 
And, and, and the, this is, again, where the possibilities start opening up. And I think this is something that I've been working with my teams on recently and, and in a lot of conversations I have with practitioners is technology is now opening up the possibilities of what we can do. So even in that example, you think about confidential or private information in an organization where historically the way we would tackle a challenge like that is to say, okay, we're dealing with this thing, social security numbers private health information, PHI in an organization, and we need to be super careful and we don't want that to be breached or leaked. And so what do we do? Well, we create some learning because that's what we've known how to do. Now we, we put it in the LMS, we send out an email and say mandatory training for everybody, make sure you do this training. Everybody mashes through the keyboard and gets to the quiz. Although I did a survey that actually contradicts that that's what everybody does. So I have to actually change my tune on that. But the bottom line is that's that's kind of the approach that we've had to take. And now with technology, like in this, you mentioned here's someone's medical records and medical records gets highlighted. And to your point, you now have this, hey, if, if you are putting any patient information in here, do not do that type of a thing where we can actually in real time provide people with those nudges of information to, to do that. Now, that goes back though to the design standpoint you could easily have made those nudges a block of 1400 characters. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Yeah, the tool can be very powerful and it can be either really smart, fun, engaging that achieves its objective in supporting somebody in their moment of need, or it can be a you know, huge legacy piece of, of content that nobody's going to digest. And it's just, you know, it's totally up to the, the person building the learning. Right. And I think that's the important point is the fact that the tool is only as good as the the architect behind it. Because again, if you had typed work remotely and clicked on that and there were 1300 characters of just block of text about yeah. not necessarily relevant information and then a list to every a link to every e-learning in your LMS that is related to it you're going to get a lot of that feedback of like, stop showing me this. This is annoying. This is not helping me. So I can, I can definitely see opportunity where you could radically transform what you're doing from a performance support standpoint. You also could really annoy the heck out of people if you're not doing it right. And I, to me, I look at it and go, this is an op awesome opportunity to take some creative risks. Emojis, you know, use emojis, use, gifs, gifs you know, that make people laugh to grab their attention. Even the structure that you showed in yours, it's like, what are the most, most commonly answered questions that we get? Here's the three, you know, here's a link to additional resource. Being able to actually architect that information in a way that goes, what does the user really most likely need? That I think cannot be understated. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, and I, I think that's true of all of the, the technology in our L and D stacks today. Like they've gotten so deep, and there's so much capability. But it fundamentally comes back to what are you what are you trying to achieve with this, and how is that helping you know drive the business outcomes that you're looking for, and does what I'm doing right now support and enable that in a in a way that creates an engaging, positive user ex learner experience. Um, sure. and, 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 you know, when people put hands to keyboards to do this, they just have to be thinking that way. Right. With, with great power comes great responsibility, yeah, exactly. the Peter Parker <laughs> principle. And I, I mean, in, in all seriousness, so this yeah. is where we're getting in this learning tech stack where we can do some insanely crazy, powerful things to improve the workforce, but we can also do a lot of damage if we're not careful. And I think that's where we really do legitimately have to be careful with our pop up knowledge nuggets type of a thing. And say, I had to get it in. I had to get it in one more time. Um, so I do want to ask this, you know, cause we're going to run out of time and I could just keep going on this. Cause this is a fascinating, not only capability, but also just topic as we think about information design and user experience. I mean, this is a completely different way of thinking about it, but let me talk about the implementation piece, you know, as you, because sometimes one of the challenges when it comes to implementation is they're extremely complicated. You know, you think about pulling together an enterprise LXP and hooking up all your content sources and integrating with the 500 different systems you're trying to pull into this mix. It can be a lot to manage. 
Talk to me about, you know, from an implementation standpoint, what really is the complexity or what kind of things need to be considered or, or is it pretty straightforward? You talked about it hooks up to email, you know, some of your basic things, but, but walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, it's um, so I've, I've spent, you know, 15 years implementing uh, uh, HR technology and the success factors, and uh, it's grown increasingly complex to do implementations like that. So, you know, having been That's on that nice. side of the table, as everybody That's knows, nice. right? <laughs> Amazon just learned this, I think, with their, their Workday implementation, right? It's, yeah, that was a, really, that was... really hard. Um, and so we've, we've very deliberately tried to make this an incredibly lightweight solution. So as you saw, it's uh, solving a specific use case. Uh, it's very lightweight. It's a Chrome extension that just needs to be installed either at an individual level or at an organization level. So that's kind of one decision point is, you know, we're going to push this Chrome extension out to, to everybody. Okay. Um, but beyond that, it just works. Right. It's up to the, you know, the person creating the content to log into the Olafano editor to create these little content pieces. And so it's, you know, loading a GIF, it's adding the, the text. And then as okay. soon as you save that, everybody who has that, ex your, your company's version of the extension enabled gets those keywords triggered in, in real time. Okay. So that's actually extremely helpful from an architecture standpoint for me to kind of think through, because again, that's that's even simpler than I think I was even imagining in my head how this was working because really it's all through Chrome then. I mean, basically anything with Chrome, it's, it's capable of looking at and saying, hey, here's what's going on in this. So as long as people are doing things in their browser, there's really only one point of integration because you're saying, well, we, we've just got to get the browser integration implemented into that and then activate them into the Olafano resource. And then at that point, they're tapped in and, and we're just looking for those keywords. That's right. And it's not even a Chrome integration, right? It's just installing no, an extension. No, it's an extension. Which people do every day for a whole you know, variety of reasons. You have a, a Zoom extension that you just, you know, you get a link, you click download and, and, and you're done. Um, and then you enable the extension to, you know, enable it to work and scan the text. And then your L&D team has that work of creating the courses. You're not yeah. necessarily courses, but the performance support. Pop up knowledge nuggets. <laughs> um, okay, so then, but let's talk authentication on this because I think this could be something where people, you're you're inevitably going to have if you're pursuing something like this, and whether it's Olafon or other things. There's, I've been kicked in the teeth more times than I'd like to say when it comes to you go to IT and you're like, hey, we've got this great thing. I think we figured out how we might be able to manage this kind of thing. And it's like, well, hang on a second now. So yes, it's as easy as somebody getting a Chrome extension, but there's an authentication process that's happening so that it's not when IT security and compliance starts asking questions, you're authenticating through Olafana, which is then authenticating off of your company's credentials, correct? That's right. For both Microsoft and for Google, we're authenticating through the paths that you would use for any other piece of software you, where you see the little sign in with Google we're authenticating against your company's, you know, email address and putting you into the instance for your particular company. Okay. Now there is, okay. you know, during the early discussion process, you're going to go to your IT team and you're going to say, Hey, we have this great Chrome extension. What is it? What they ask, you know, what is it? Do? Well, it scans text and, you know, it, it, it triggers keywords. It's like, well, you know, we need to double click on that scanning text thing. You know, that's part of a, a sales type of discussion to just, you know, educate IT on, Here's what we're doing. And we have the documentation on our side to say, here's the data we're capturing. Here's how we're throwing away all the stuff that we're, you know, aren't keyword. You know, we're not saving that back anywhere so they don't have that uh, security risk. But the discussion that we have with them. Okay. Okay. Got it. Well, and I think that's an important piece because it's easy sometimes to get excited about these things and then not think this through. And then you run into, you run into hurdles with, with IT or your security team or your compliance team. And so while yes, it's as easy as, okay, hey, it's a Chrome extension. At the same point, then it's like, well, but we're authenticating this. It's authenticating with our users. Only employees are having access to this. And then you still have that other line of defense in the sense that if you're linking to other internal resources, that is still going to have its own authentication. I mean, obviously, if you have a single sign-on, that's one thing. But 
it's it's going to then push if you're trying to push somebody out to work day or another one of your systems it's actually then going to say hey like here here's how that works and you're going to have to re-authenticate so yeah that's exactly right we're not extending those permissions so all of the native permissions for where content sits it's, it's really just hyperlinked um okay. to the original uh source content um okay okay Interesting. Interesting. Well, um, you know, so I think any other big, any other considerations that you've seen as you've gone down this path of things, because again, I, I'm thinking one, this is a shift in your design thinking. This is a shift in the way you think about content design and really push. We talked a little bit about the security side. Any other things that, you know, as you've talked to users or customers, that you've said, hey, we didn't anticipate this or things that somebody who might be looking to shift more towards this performance nudge model would need to take into consideration? No, I think we've talked about the things that come up. It, it really is a different way of thinking about that last mile of learning, though. So sure. a lot of times when we're talking about learning and the flow of work, what people are saying is there's a search toolbar and it's a hyper efficient search against things. And so this is a little bit different where we're saying we're going to give them these bite-sized nuggets of learning in their moment of need. We need to create bite-sized learning uh, for, for people in, in their moment of need. And that it requires some creativity and some innovation on the, on the R&D side to really, you know, uh, maximize the value that they could get from a solution like this. Okay. Okay. Well, I've got about 16 other avenues that I want to go in this conversation, but we are out of time and I have a meeting that I'm going to have to get ready for. Otherwise, I actually have some follow-up questions that I would ask you, but I'm going to hold on those because I think this was, I think we hit on a lot of the big points in terms of one, how to just think differently about it. And again, I would advocate, it's, it's a big shift. You know, if you're a learning designer, if you're a learning leader, this is a fundamental shift. You could, I can completely see taking this capability and having it just fall flat on its face if you're not careful with it because you're just doing what you've always done and now you're annoying your user in a new and creative way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, oh. the, that's the risk. The, 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 the pro side, the pitch that I would make is it gives L&D an opportunity yes. to get in front of their learners in a new, creative, innovative way to start to solve for some of those things that have always been a challenge, like, you know, getting people to access my content, managing that forgetting curve where they walk out and then completely forget and two minutes later ask me a question that I answered in, in the training that, that we can solve for those things. And so it's a new tool in the stack. If used, you know, creatively and thoughtfully can have a huge impact across the organization. Agreed. Agreed. So one last question from Deborah. Deb, she said I could call her Deb. I did ask. She said that was totally <laughs> fine. Um, real quick is on that, you know, is, is it, are you able to at this point, because I know it's still early stage, are you able to then say, hey, are these pop-up knowledge nuggets, I won't sing it again for everyone else's sake, but are you able to restrict those by roles? Are you able to organize this or how does that work? Today, it's blanket across the organization. Okay. So by organization, you define these for your company, your instance, Olafano. Ultimately, we will go that direction where you could, you know, create audiences effectively or leverage audiences from your LXP uh, to create these pop-ups for, you know, specific audiences or groups of users. Okay. Got it. Got it. So again, just going back to the thoughtful consideration of how you would use this so that, and no, Deborah, we, we are not going to say we want to market this as a new and creative way to annoy your <laughs> end users, but it has the potential to go that way. And I think that's where the thoughtful design behind it is to say, you need to think carefully about it. You need to think about how you're going to do it. And that intentionality behind it is key. So with that, David, this has been a super fun conversation. I know it's been a long time in the queue, and I'm so glad we finally were able to have it. I really am excited to hear where you're going and what you've shared, and hopefully everybody listening and watching it's made you think a little bit differently about it and also brought you back to those amazing VH1 pop-up videos that we, we all so fondly remember. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday, a great weekend, and thanks, everybody, for joining.